the shock that they probably experienced when all of a sudden they said, it's, it's, it's Achan, it's our daddy that made that mistake. And they already knew that it was death. Um, that's a pretty sobering thought and realizing that, that it affected that whole family and God's judgment upon that family. It just really brings, um, kind of brings a sobering thought thinking even of our own experiences as fathers, as heads of homes. You know, how are our families affected by the decisions that we make? Um, but God's grace is there available, and that's the blessing. God's forgiveness is there available. We can, we can, uh, we can find repentance. We can find uh, forgiveness. Uh, for announcements, um, looking forward to a message by Todd this morning. And uh, tonight, no evening service. This afternoon, um, I think Jesse sent the word out about singing at Aspen Acres at 2.30. Anything else on that, Jesse? So outside singing, so the more the, the better. 2.30 in Hayward at Aspen Acres. Um, and then tonight, what time is that tonight? Is it 6.30 tonight uh, for the school um, getting ready? Not sure exactly what it's called, but um, parents and students, um, kind of a time of setup. 6.30 tonight here at, uh, at school. Uh, school starts on Monday morning. Ben Hershey is on for devotions. Uh, bless the teachers and students as they gear in on, on school again. Uh, Wednesday evening, no service this week. And a um, couple of announcements uh, for the upcoming events here. A uh, week from or this coming Saturday is the, the harvest event um, coming up. Any announcements there? I don't think so. It's all over the place. Okay. So that starts at 4.30, correct? Um, Supper is at 4.30. Okay. But generally people start showing up about 3.30. Okay. Um, let's also continue to pray for Eric, uh, Eric and Julia. They'll be heading to Ontario uh, tomorrow, right? And meetings from Tuesday through Sunday. So let's keep them in prayer. Big responsibility there of speaking in God's word. Um, some birthdays and I guess it's just birthdays this week. Kyle's got a birthday on Tuesday. 24, is that correct? Can't see him right now, but I believe so. Um, Christina Gingrich has a birthday on Wednesday. They're not here today. Uh, 64, if my math is correct on that. Arla, birthday on Saturday. Not sure if they're here or not. Um, 59. So happy birthday to each one of those. Anything else that um, anybody would like to... Announce. Yeah, we just want to express our appreciation for an incredibly generous offering a few weeks ago. We're moved by that, and uh, it also seems uh, it's a humbling thing to realize that we seem to have less and less to contribute. And people are so generous with us, and we certainly are not. Well, may the Lord continue to bless you as you go forward. Let's stand for a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much, God, that you are continually faithful to each one of us. And God, meeting our needs spiritually and physically. And Lord, I thank you, God, for this morning that we can be together here in this way. I just pray, God, that you would open each one of our hearts as we desire to hear from you. God, give Todd the words to speak. Uh, give him a clarity and an openness just to share what you've laid on his heart. God, we thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness, and for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. 
Good morning to all of you and greetings in the name of Christ. This morning's message is probably the last in a series of why many are leaving the narrow road and turning to the wide road that leads to destruction. Um, first we spoke how we widen the road by not caring for the needy, not seeing Jesus in every person of need around us. And last time we looked at how technology has taken many, even ourselves at times, off the narrow way and on the wide road. Um, this morning's message changed the title, I guess, after Sunday school. What was Aiken's problem? Um, appreciated Linwood leading out in that. I think we're going to preach about Aiken's problem today. So it's astounding today how people leaving the church, the bride of Christ, and we're living in good times. Like have any of you faced persecution like gun to your head or a knife to your throat because you're serving Jesus Christ? We're living in really good times. And yet seemingly in unprecedented good times, unprecedented precedented numbers from ministry, laity, whoever, evangelists are, are leaving the church. Um, I'd like to try to address some of that today. We are a very feeling-driven culture. We're a very feeling-driven generation. A culture so in tune with feelings that we feel if we aren't following our feelings, we're being hypocrites. Rather than the discipline of exercising self-control, doing things you don't even feel like, we wait for our feelings to lead the way to a better place. Um, Hudson Taylor hits, I believe, something that's very paramount. Hudson Taylor was interviewing uh, many applicants, young people who had volunteered for the Lord's service, and he asked several, actually he asked most, um, the practical question to find out how well qualified they were for the life they were anticipating. And this is the question for the missionaries prospective. Why do you wish to go on a foreign field as a missionary? Um, a common response was, I want to reach others across the sea because Christ has commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Another common response was, I want to go because millions are dying without ever having heard of Jesus, the only one who can save them. Many similar responses. Hudson Taylor's response to these answers was to look at them thoughtfully and then said, all of your motives are good, but I fear they will fail you in times of severe testing and tribulation, especially if you're confronted with the possibility of having to face death for your testimony. The only motive that will enable you to remain true is stated in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Christ's love constrains me to go. That will keep you in every situation. The love of Christ as constrains us. Um, the other word would be to control us or compel us. Um, it, it talks about being wrapped in, um, all enclosed. You look at the love of Christ, and it's, it's the thing that says it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things, and then it says charity never fails. That's the ingredient. Because there will be times of testing. There will be times of tribulation. In fact, there will be times of mundane. What's going to keep you in the mundane? It takes more than a person following feelings to endure. We must be filled with the love of Christ. I don't know if you struggle being filled with the love of Christ at times. I don't know if, if at times that varies in your life. Um, for me, it does. If it doesn't for you, then you pray for me. Um, Matthew 24, verse 7 talks about the end times and how many are going to be departing from the faith. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. 
Then shall they deliver you to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I believe this is describing our day that we're living in, when we see so many walking away from Christ and his church. Um, trials and persecutions come, things that you don't want to have to deal with. Um, apostasies and false prophets from without. Trials and persecutions, sorry, apostasies and false prophets from within. Trials and persecutions from without. Verse 10, this is how they respond. Some openly desert the faith. Verse 11, others corrupt their faith. They'll change their faith to fit what fits in. And verse 12, and others grow indifferent about their faith. The love of many, or the love of the most, will wax cold. I wonder, when your love is waning, what are you going to do about it? I'm not going to have you raise your hand if you loved coming to church this morning. I'm not going to put you on the spot. But there are times when you didn't feel like coming to church. I, I'm sure of that. Uh, there's times when you didn't feel like coming Sunday night because you're tired. There's times you didn't feel like giving, stopping your work and coming Wednesday night. There's times when feelings didn't fit. And we're a hypocrite if we're, if we're not following our feelings, right? Wrong. Dead wrong. But you watch yourself how often you'll convince yourself of that. Love is never a force out of your control. It's not just a feeling that, you know, when I get that feeling, then I'm going to be all in. But when I get the feeling that I want to, then I will. Because then I'm not a hypocrite. Love is never a force out of your control. Love is a choice and a whole lot of work. Love is a choice and a whole lot of work. Um, I'm reading, this is actually something that I found online. This is not uh, a Bible uh, person, preacher, um, saying this is what scripture says. This is actually what modern teaching is trying to get across, realizing the detriment of people who follow their feelings. Love is a choice and a decision because your actions determine if love will live on or your love will end. You are in control how you act in your relationships and how much you push past conflict and challenges. When you decide to work on communication, trust, intimacy, or emotional security, surrender, humility, you're choosing love. One prominent pastor who resigned recently and joined the LGBQRSTV or whatever all the letters are on that now, joined that movement, said, you know, I have not had the f feeling of being into it, and I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I quit. There's a deception going on there because your emotions don't make you a hypocrite. But most of us put the blame on our feelings, on our emotions, for our lack of love, for our lack of commitment. For We put the blame on, I'm not feeling it. Because that requires no practical change. If you only go by, you know, if I feel like it, if that becomes your bottom line, um, it requires no practical change because you're saying, when I do feel like it, I'll be there. I'll do it. I'll, whatever it takes, I, but I have to feel it first. <clears throat> That's how I do weight loss. I, I never wake up and say, I have the feeling I'm going to lose weight. I, I'm hungry, but I got the feeling that just drives me. I am not going to eat. I'm going to starve myself. I'm going to eat oatmeal and yogurt, and that's it. Y 
you're going to have to ignore your emotions and your feelings. And you're going to have to do what you need to do. Marriage vows have been taken apart. You've seen it in your day. I've seen it in my day. Troubles come, and one party says, you know, my feelings are more important than my covenant. You'll see this frequently, even among professing Christians. My feelings are more important than my covenant. Literally, many people saying, I had to leave my marriage because I am just tired of living in hypocrisy. I just don't have feelings for them. And I've waited a long time for those feelings to come. There's people leaving church vows. They've been taken apart. They've been disillusioned. Disagreement or troubles come. We're in a generation that says my feelings are more important than my covenant. I hope my feelings grows because when my feelings is given the lead, my actions will follow. <coughs> the modern day answer to losing the feeling of love for someone or something it's just, I, I'm going to keep doing the things I'm doing the best I can, and hopefully that love emotion comes back, and then I can really do it. But if it doesn't, obviously I'll have to do something different. It's a very twisted in its mind frame. Like I said, I'm not going to put you on the spot this morning, but I would have to raise my hand and say, I have struggled with feelings of first love toward my Savior, toward my spouse, toward my church, I've struggled with that. When those struggles come, how do you improve? How do you handle those struggles? How do you keep from becoming despondent and washing out? Turn to Revelation chapter 2. I ask this, or I'll quote this again. Why is love a choice? Love is a choice and a decision because your actions determine if love will live on or if love will end. You are in control of how you act in your relationships and how much you push past conflict and challenges in your covenant to love. How do I prevent my love from growing cold? How do I prevent my love from growing cold and me leaving the narrow way? How do I come back if my love has grown cold? I'm guessing in a group of this size there are people who say, I'm already there. How do I come back? Jesus isn't quiet on this matter. I, I would like to say this. How you come back from a love that's grown cold to you, towards your spouse, towards God's word, and towards the church is not that you pray and continue doing as you have been doing is not because that's how you got where you're at Jesus has the answers here Revelation chapter 2 verse 1 under the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience how, so, how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted nevertheless I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlesticks out of its place except thou repent but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now this church had a proven record of patience and discernment and endurance. But they were missing that thing called first love in their hearts. I think that's what Achan was missing. We'll touch on that later. But this is what he says to do. Before God puts their candle out, first love is extremely important. Loving to come to God's house is important. Loving your spouse from your heart is important. How do we get there? 
Loving God's word is so essential. <coughs> if your love for God's word has grown cold, how do you get that love back? This is what he says. There's three steps that he gives us here in verse 5. Number one, in verse 5, it says, Realize from where you have fallen. Whence thou hast fallen is the King James. One of the greatest deceptions is losing, in losing your first love, is look at these people. They were extremely good at perceiving how others were wrong. Very good. They, it gives a list. They, they figured out who the Nicolaitans, they're all messed up. Um, and they proved these other people saying, are, are they apostles? And, and they were extremely perceptive about others. But his commandment to them, number one, is you want your first love back, remember from where you have fallen. Stop looking around at others. Thinking, you know, if, if, if the Nicolaitans would get their act together, I'd probably enjoy coming to church. If these other people would get... It, Remember from where you have fallen. See, all of us have that same gift. It's we're good at perceiving where others have fallen, where others have disappointed us, where our spouse has disappointed us, where God has disappointed us, where we've become bored. At God's word isn't living and alive for us anymore. And, and but do we take responsibility? Number one is remember from where you have fallen. We get ingrained in our minds naturally that the whole world around us needs changed, but not us, at least not that much. I was interested at the story of Robert Fulton who invented the steam-driven boat. He was at his first demonstration of his steamboat and one of those can't be done fellows was in the crowd and he stood at the edge of the crowd at the edge of the bank and as Robert Fulton was firing up his steamship the fellow was yelling he can't start her he can't start her suddenly there was a belch of steam and smoke and the big wheel started turning and the boat started moving the fellow hesitated and stared momentarily and he said well, he can't stop her. He can't stop her. See, Robert Fulton was the one wrong. Let's get that in our minds, all right? That's the long and the short of it. Uh, too bad one of us wasn't there to give him the elbow and say, Sir, you have some issues, personal issues. Uh, you're blind to your own stubbornness. And you're an embarrassment to your own cause. <laughs> I'm a... God's here to say you have issues. Remember from where you have fallen. Stop looking around and, and look at yourself and realize this is how I was when I first met my wife. This is how I was when I first came to the Lord. This is how I was when I first became part of the body of Christ. That's how it was. But now I look at myself and see where I'm at now and it's a lot different. And is taking responsibility and saying, that's my deal. That's my problem. If you want your first love, God says, remember from where you have fallen. William Cowper writes these words. Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul refreshing view of Jesus and his word? Can you relate to what he's saying? He goes on to say in another verse, the dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me that idol to cast down and worship only thee. Remember from where I've fallen. And then he says, so shall my walk be close with God, calm and serene my frame, so pure a light shall mark the road that leads me to the Lamb. I believe William was touching something that touches pretty close to home for us. The love of many will grow cold in the last days. There's no one here who, I, if I would say, you know, are you busy? <laughs> yeah, we're, are you too busy? Yeah, probably that too. Barely keep up. 
And you know what happens? Good things, ministry even, good things, can take the place of things in our heart that they shouldn't take the place of. An idol, it's called. But one day that thing that has become an enjoyment to be needs to be axed in order for first love to be real. You know this in your marriage. Uh, you can be doing some super great things for the community. You can be, be doing some super great things for the church and people around you. You can share the gospel in ways that, wow, great job. And if your relationship at home is falling apart with your wife, something's got to go. Because number one, as Christ loved the church, you love your wife. Something's got to go. Number one, realizing from where I have fallen in priorities. Remember from where you have fallen. First love, to be a thing again, I believe we need to take personal accountability and we also have to have the ability to receive advice from the person who opposes us. Um, like I think it was Mark that said in Sunday school class, your enemy is probably going to tell you the most truth. The person that opposes you is trying to tell you something. Hey, you, you got that too high in your life. You, you got to bring that back a little bit. Yeah, but it's a good thing. All of us would rather have a feeling of first love before changing priorities. But if we're missing the emotion of love for God, church, family, neighbor, if we're missing the priority of first love, then change the emotion comes after changing the action. That's upside down for our culture. It's upside down for me. But if we're losing our first love, first of all, it requires a step of obedience, not a step of feeling. Hey, I feel like doing this, now I'm going to do it. It requires a step of obedience. And then, secondly, first of all, remember from whence you have fallen. Secondly, it says, and repent. Now, that's a really short point. It says, change your action. It's time to change something. And I am willing to change something. And what am I willing to change? Number three, and do the first works. Remember, when once you have fallen, repent and do the first works. I was at a wedding on Friday, and it's fun to watch newly married couples. I mean, you kind of look at them and think, you know, they're clueless. But there's something beautiful about the first love. Um, do you remember the time first love we're talking about um, do you remember the time you would give anything and everything in order to just be together do you remember that you'd give up anything when you were dating you wouldn't hesitate to say anything you, sorry you would extremely hesitate to say anything that might overwhelm her you would carefully craft your words because you don't want to overwhelm this beautiful lady uh, you love her you care about her deeply uh, remember when you would take your wife out on a date you just wanted to spend time together it didn't even matter where you went McDonald's was great, it don't matter and you would talk about what she wants to talk about you remember when she would do something kind of stupid and you'd say oh, yeah, you know I, I do stupid stuff all the time you don't have to feel bad about that you're one of ours oh, but now it's different now you're embarrassed when she says something wrong in public now you think you know come on Remember when you used to take extra steps in order to walk along beside your girlfriend? Remember when you used to open the door? 
But the first works are long gone, and so is the first love. I stopped praying for my spouse. Sorry, I stopped praying for my spouse that she would accept and love me because now I'm not sure what I think of her. Do you remember when you first accepted Jesus in your heart? There was nothing going to stand in your way of fellowship at a church, at his word, at hearing the gospel again. It, it made your heart burn within you. This was the life. This was the first love. Do the first works. That's what he says. You want the first love for Christ, for the church, for your spouse, for the people around you? It, remember how you, far you have fallen. You have fallen. Don't put it on them. Don't say, well, when they straighten that out, then I'll be. No, remember from where you have fallen and change. And do the first works. Plug in the whole way. The whole way. If, if I'm unimpressed with church and I don't, I'm not in love with church, you know what is tempting? Well, I don't need to come Sunday night and I don't need to come Wednesday night. I'll just, you know, if God puts that love in my heart, I'll be there. But do the first works. Plug in the whole way and see what God can do. But most of us are slothful in relationships and I am my wife can testify I get sloppy I get slothful in relationships and that's where we lose first love slothful in relationships number one it means we're not doing the first works and why is that well it happens to normal people who make little surrenders and daily decisions that's how slothful in relationships comes it happens to normal people who begin making little surrenders in daily decisions. One day little surrenders become an acceptable habit and next thing you know you're missing your first love. You're not plugged in. You're not all in. And it didn't all happen with one whoosh. You know I'm not going to come there anymore. It came with just little surrenders in daily decisions. And one day it's bigger than what you realize. Um you know, there's some people who, well, I'm going to do the first love. I'm going to take my wife flowers. I, I'm going to um, impress her with flowers. I'm going to buy her flowers like I used to when I was young. Well, I got news for you. You couldn't afford flowers when you were young. All right? Not many flowers. Um, the first love, you couldn't afford flowers. You couldn't afford much of anything. But what you could afford was time, notes, and sacrifice. Ah, but those take a lot of work. And so we become lazy in these things, just little daily surrenders. We become lazy in these things, and we wonder, where does first love go? Well, let me buy flowers and just get back to normal. Well, that's not back to normal. We need to put effort. We need to put action into the first love. Second thing a slothful person does in relationships is they never feel like they are the one who is slothful. You know, when things are growing distant between me and my wife, I can tell you whose fault it is. It ain't mine. Because we get lazy. I get lazy in relationships. There's just too many obstacles in the way. You know, one thing is for sure, and that is covenants will always be proved one day. One day. One day, the wind will blow hard enough that all that's left standing is the covenant. And now the question is, are you going to keep that standing? There will always come a day when obstacles in the way seem more than the required effort to accomplish a task. And for men, that usually results in anger. For ladies, that usually results in being overwhelmed. But there always comes a day when obstacles in the way seem more than the required effort to accomplish the task. Covenants are made because feelings won't always be there. There's days you're going to feel lazy. There's days you're going to feel sick of the battle. That is why the covenant, because it must supersede how I feel. My actions in relation to that covenant must be governed 
by my actions and my commitment and my covenant. It cannot be governed by my feelings. I truly believe covenant-keeping people are the only ones who will persevere in hard times. They will keep the, they will continue the first works regardless of how they feel or the obstacles in their way. And so you'll see them in churches. You'll see them 30 years, 50 years down the road, still a member of the church through thin and thin and a little bit of thick because the commitment and the covenant was more to them than the wind and the rain blowing around them. And they kept the first love because they kept the first actions real in their life. And I'm blessed by those people. I want to be with one of those. I don't want to be lazy. I want to learn. I want to learn on the days I lose my first love. The third slothfulness that we can get caught in is the person in relationships. If we're slothful in relationships, we're always a victim. It's always a cause outside of our own responsibility. You know, if, if my husband would have, uh, if my wife would have, if the church would have, you know, if God would have answered my prayer in this way, I would have, uh, and it's always their fault. So my question as I wrap this up, is everybody awake? This is my question. What would your life look like what would your marriage look like? What would your church look like? What would your devotional life look like if you laid aside slothfulness? No matter the obstacle that came in front of me, nothing was going to stand in my way of first love. What would your marriage look like? What would your church look like? What would your relationship with God's word look like? Nothing will stand in my way of first love. I'm going to do the first works. The feelings are going to be in the back, but actually they're going to kept up, catch up. I believe God's stamp is looking to impart his agape love in the heart that he sees that is committed 100% to pursue him in action. I believe God will bless that heart with agape love. If you're here today and you're missing your first love, I believe he tells us here where to find it. Remember from where you have fallen. Stop looking with a critical eye elsewhere. Your perception's great, but it's time to look at you. And it's time to change. And it's time to do the first works. It's time to be all in. Nothing stands in the way. First love is so precious. Um, John Newton was a well past his retirement age, a man who wrote Amazing Grace. In fact, he was so far past his retirement age, uh, they didn't have microphones like this to proclaim things, and he couldn't speak much more than a whisper. So they had a helper up there that he would whisper to the helper, and the helper would yell it out for the congregation to hear. Um, that would have its own challenges. Uh, one Sunday morning, while delivering his message, John repeated this sentence, Jesus Christ is precious. And his helper turned to him and whispered, uh, Newton, you've already said that twice. And Newton turned from the helper and to the crowd and yelled in the loudest voice he could, Yes, and it needs said again, Jesus Christ is precious. I don't know if that's in your heart. Is that first love where that preciousness of he, he is my everything. Is it there? Is that your whisper? Is that your cry that you proclaim? Is that the life that you live? Jesus Christ is precious and I'll say it again. If you're able to kneel, would you kneel for prayer? Father in heaven, I thank you this morning for your word most of all. We live in a day that is so many, their love is growing cold. 
at home, at church, for your word. Lord, we studied Achan and how a heart that doesn't have a love for you can so quickly go off the rails. Lord, we dedicate ourselves to you again, asking you to fill us as we put into action our first love at home and at church and in your word. Fill us with that love, that agape love. We're willing to sacrifice. We're willing to, not willing to settle for any obstacle in our way. We will push through at any cost. Lord, fill us with that love in these days. In Jesus' name, amen.